a good idea to associate with someone like me. Well, I, I no longer agreed with their worldview. And examples of the inaccuracy is the Crusades, Nazism, was blamed on the church. Now, the church's problem with Nazism was not that they enthusiastically supported Nazism. The church's problem was not commission, but omission. They did virtually nothing, unfortunately. Galileo is probably the most abused story historically relative to the relationship between the church and science. Bruno, another case, I can read some quotes here, which if we get time later on, I will, the Inquisition and so on. By and large, I saw the atheists only saw the bad in Christianity. When I went to atheist meetings, we talked about primarily all the bad Christians and how the world would be a really nice place if only there was all those bad Christians were gone. And I agreed with them by and large, but they weren't all bad. They saw nothing good about Christianity. And even the Watchtower, even though I left and they shunned me and I couldn't talk to my friends, the fact is that there are good things about the Watchtower, as there are good things about Christians. And this one-sidedness, I thought, was inappropriate. What bothered me a lot was that you cannot judge a religion by those who don't follow it. And when they judge Christianity, they're obviously judging it by those who aren't following it. And that bothered me. Okay. Uh, one thing that bothered me the most, though, is that even though I left the Watchtower and left the atheists, I strongly did and will defend their right to what they believe. And I saw... Now, I'm not saying that about the atheist group here. I don't know. So I can't judge. From what I heard, the atheist group here is a bunch of nice people. Is that right? That's you okay. So that's right. So I can't judge everyone, but nonetheless, my experience was they wanted to eliminate religion, especially Christianity, first from the public square, then from the private sphere, and eventually from society. And I guess being an atheist, there was really a lot of joy because we won court case after court case. We had favorable press by the media. We had a lot of support. I felt I was in the majority. Of course, statistically I wasn't, but that's how I felt. And essentially, I saw the atheist movement that I was part of as someone intolerant. No room for theists. And leaving the atheist was problematic because where do I go? Not that one needs to go somewhere, but a belief structure is important for most people. We, we need to have a belief structure to orient our life. And so I couldn't accept theism because of my negative experience, because of the Watchtower experience, and also because of the simple fact that, well, we got here by evolution, so what's the point of believing in God? If you survey people as to why they believe in God, most people will give you as the primary reason because we have a creation, therefore we must have a creator. So then I decided to reevaluate what I believed and what I started out with was evolution. I listed every proof of Darwinism that I could find in the textbooks that I used in college. And here you can see I list six. Vestigial organs, homology, and so on. And I evaluated each one of these one at a time. The first one I chose was vestigial organs. And this is the Encyclopedia Britannica which is a current edition, and it says, the human body, for instance, has more than a hundred such vestigial organs. The appendix, the fused tail vertebra, the coccyx, in other words, wisdom teeth, and so on. So I, is this true? So I thought I could easily find out whether or not it's true, or at least begin to make progress. Went to the medical school library, and I searched and looked for references relative to if these structures had any use, and I found eventually all of them in humans at least, had a very clear function. All of them. And now we know for the appendix, for example, there are more than several functions. There's several functions which were recently uh, discovered. I wrote a book called Vestigial Organs Are Fully Functional with a work with a professor, George Howe, who was a PhD from Ohio State, and a professor also who was a professor at a medical school in uh, St. Louis. And as a result of my research, I have now over 800 publications, primarily looking at this question whether or not evolution is based on, and again, keep in mind my definition, is based on the evidence. And I concluded based on science alone, I wasn't looking at religious books, I was looking at science alone, 
based on scientific research, secular sources alone, I conclude that Darwinism simply did not hold up. Now my conclusion now is evolution, given my definition, did not occur and could not occur, and that conclusion is a result of science. The next step then for me, and for many people by the way, this next step does not occur. I have a number of friends who do not buy into evolution who are still atheists or agnostics. It's the next step to conclude that then, therefore we must to explain the origin of life, the universe, etc. I then looked at theism and eventually came back to a theistic position which was actually very different from the position that I was raised around. And so I was for the second time a heretic and I wrote a book called Persuaded by the Evidence which is back here and I found my story is not at all unusual. There are a lot of people who became first of all believers in a creation rejected Darwinism and believed there was intelligence behind the creation and some went on to become Christians some did not. And the book basically documents a number of these cases. I have a list on the internet now of 3,000 PhD scientists who have, by and large, uh, rejected uh, orthodox Darwinism. Okay, what is taught? Well, I surveyed about 100 biology teachers, called them up, and asked them how they handle origins. I used an open-ended approach because I thought they'd be more open and honest. And this is what I found. Almost all the professors and teachers that I talked to taught creation and intelligent design. The problem is not whether it's taught, the problem is what is taught about creation or intelligent design. Okay? And I concluded that everyone is a creationist. The only difference is who is the creator. We're all creations. Atheists believe that time and accumulation of mutations, outwork of natural law, chance, etc. is the creator. I believe that intelligence is behind the creation. So we're all creations. The difference is who is the creator. When I interviewed these professors, I found that many taught theistic evolution. They taught that God used evolution to create. And my thought is, this is teaching religion. They're teaching religion widely in our schools and colleges. I thought that was unconstitutional. I don't teach religion, at least in science class. I don't think it's a good idea to teach religion in science class. And most ID supporters that I know agree. It is not a good idea to teach religion in a science class. Okay? You don't teach uh, astronomy in a uh, mathematics class. Well, I guess you could, but uh, it's a matter of what's appropriate. And uh, a common, another approach I found was that religion and science are separate. Religion's here, religion's faith. Science is here, science is fact. This is also teaching religion. So I found I was the one who was not teaching religion and most of the people I called up, talked to, were teaching religion. How about teachers who are creationists? Ironically, what they do is often ignore the subject. So it seems that the evolutionists are teaching religion, the creationists are not. And by the way, this study should be replicated. It needs to be larger, much more data. This study for me was a preliminary study which I did present at a conference uh, recently. Okay, uh, I could also mention some biology teachers who were evolutionists experienced problems and especially at the high school level and thought I'll just avoid the whole subject. Didn't learn anything about evolution. And most IDP, all ID supporters that I know believe that we need to teach more about evolution. The problem is we don't teach enough about evolution. Uh, some say to their class, well I don't believe in evolution but I have to teach it. Well that again is think teaching religion. You're telling something about religion which I don't feel has a place in a science class. Uh, one professor, he was interesting, he taught at Purdue University and I talked to a number of the students, he says I teach all theories, creationism, intelligent design, theistic evolution, panspermia, really? Yes he did, that's what he said. I talked to the students, they thought they loved it. They said really interesting and they learned about myths from other cultures, the Mayan myth and two or three other myths. And they, they, everyone I interviewed said, we really like this class. And he himself was an evolutionist. Well, he said he was. But nonetheless, he presented all theories. And I asked his students, was he fair? Said, yeah, he did a good job presenting all of the uh, worldviews. Another approach is science has proven life originated 
by natural means. This falsifies theological explanations. Therefore, theology, God, false, not true. Science, fact, it's true. And again, this is teaching religion. In fact, one at University of Toledo, ironically, one uh, professor said, basically, if you don't agree with me, leave the class now. And several students dropped the class uh, within the hour. I thought that was kind of inappropriate, but that's what he did. Okay, I could give you some case histories, but I'm running out of time. Let me give you an example. Uh, oh, I could mention a couple of court cases. What are the courts said? Well, the courts have basically made it very clear that you can teach against religion. Okay? One court case that the Darwin Doubters won was in uh, Wisconsin, and the court ruled we have a right to talk about creation in a library. So if anybody questions your right to talk about creation in the library, you can refer them to this court case, which gave us this right. Moore versus Gaston Board of Education. This was a teacher who said Darwin's true. Genesis is false. There's no life after death. There's no heaven. There's no hell. When you die, you die, and that's it. The school didn't like that. Parents actually complained, and the school responded. And they went to court, and the judge said this is academic freedom. The teacher has a right to tell the students Darwinism is true. Genesis is false. There's no heaven. There's no hell. When you die, you die. He went well beyond that, but that's a few examples of what he taught. So the courts have ruled consistently you cannot teach the problems with evolution. And my book, Law of the Dissonance, documents that. So in essence, I think we have state-enforced religion. So atheism is taught in the schools, directly or indirectly. So congratulations. Your side is presented legally. And I'm not aware of a single case where the courts have ruled against teaching that worldview in the schools. And I have a problem with that. I don't think we should indoctrinate students in a in a worldview, which of course is what they're doing here. And by the way, many of the cases I looked at were people who were not teaching intelligent design or creation, but they were teaching problems with a Darwinian uh, worldview, such as vestigial organs, which I can relate a number of examples. Okay, moving forward. Uh, I'll give you one quick example now, which is irreducible complexity, if I have time. The idea of irreducible complexity says, okay, I'll just summarize and then hopefully I can cover it later, but give you a definition. Irreducible complexity says there's a certain minimum number of parts that is necessary for something to function. In other words, there must be two or more parts for well, watches and you name it, to function. The only exception are the fundamental particles, which would be leptons, electrons, for example, and quarks, up, the down, the top, the bottom, the strange, and the charm. So, aside from this, everything would be irreducibly complex. That has been well documented in science, and the fact is, as I'll talk about later, you get in trouble for teaching the concept of irreducible complexity. All right, well, that's our first speaker, Dr. Bergman. Um, so we're going to now give 20 minutes to uh, Dr. Myers. Uh, take it away, PZ. Very good. Well, thanks. I'm a little sorry that we were late. Uh, it was all my fault. Apologies. Uh, I, I will mention, first of all, that yes, there were like four hours of interviews done with me for Expelled, and they only kept three minutes. So, that, yeah, <laughs> I did something wrong. That's more than some people. <laughs> Okay, well, let's go back to something completely different. Uh, should intelligent design be taught in the classrooms? And I say the answer is no, and it's emphatically no, because I'll give you two reasons. One, it's not science, and that means, secondarily, there is absolutely nothing to teach. No.